at bedtime as a child, my nightly prayer was always the Lord's Prayer. I remember spending the night at my cousin's house and we prayed the Lord's Prayer together before the lights went out at night. Now with my kid, he gets to choose what song or songs I sing to him at night. And the number of songs varies by how well bedtime is going and if it's getting late. One of the options for a song is what he calls heaven. And heaven is what he calls the Lord's Prayer. And we're at the point where I've sung it enough times with him that now he sings it with me. And sometimes as we sing, he stops to ask a question about the lyrics. Now usually I can't understand what lyrics he's talking about and I have to sing and sing and sing again until I finally figure out what part he's referring to. It's a brilliant stalling technique I mean, my kid wants to know what the words of the Lord's Prayer mean. And of course, this pastor wants to explain theological implications. And so I go down that rabbit hole. And then sometimes I get smart and then it's just like, no. <laughs> so, but it's this line, give us this day our daily bread. That always gets me. Because give is the imperative making it a command. And when I was a kid, that always struck me as kind of odd. Clean your room, do your homework, feed the dog, stop fighting with your brother, give us this day our daily bread. It's easy to think that we are demanding God do something for us. But perhaps this is not actually a command. Think about it with me for a moment. We're praying to God. The subject of the sentences in a prayer is God. So could it be an affirmation instead? You, God, you give us this day our daily bread. And this would be in line with Martin Luther's understanding and explanation of this. He writes in the small catechism, in fact, God gives daily bread without our prayer, even to all evil people. But we ask in this prayer that God cause us to recognize what our daily bread is and to receive it with thanksgiving. What then does daily bread mean? Answer, everything included in the necessities and nourishment of our bodies, such as food, drink, clothing, shoes, house, farm, fields, livestock, money, property, an upright spouse, upright children, upright members of the household, upright and faithful rulers, good government, good weather, peace, health, decency, honor, good friends, faithful neighbors, and the like. Our daily bread isn't just bread. It's way more than bread. As the ancient story told in Moana goes, Maui, the shapeshifter trickster demigod, steals the heart of Tefiti in order for humans to have power over all creation, control of the seas and the land. And Maui does this as a gift to the humans so that they might love him. This, of course, backfires on Maui and all humans. Te Ka, a volcanic demon, attacks Maui and he loses his fish hook, the source of his shape-shifting powers, and the heart into the sea. And these events turn the sea into a scary place. And Moana's people, the people of Motunui, who were originally seafarers, become afraid of the sea. They stay on their island, only eating what is from the land or what they can catch within the safety of the reef surrounding the island. 
Maui's desire for cheap love has significant implications. Te Ka slowly spread destruction through the sea and from island to island. For Moana and the people of Motunui, it was often fine. However, when Moana was a teenager, the land and the sea stopped producing. And the people of Motunui were growing hungry. The land and the sea were desolate and unforgiving to humans. Maui had forgotten who provides his daily bread and the daily bread for all humans. He sought to give humans power that wasn't his to give and instead lost it all and seemingly also lost the love he sought from humans. The Israelites experienced something similar in the wilderness, crying out, complaining, wishing they were back in Egypt, the safety of the known, similar to the people of Motunui. And God gives them what they need for each day, including a day of rest. This daily bread was manna from heaven. Enough for each person each day. There were no leftovers, no hoarding, and no one going hungry. And yet, some had a scarcity mindset, unwilling to trust in the goodness and the abundance of God. They sought to gather more than their allotment and found that they only had what they needed. When they tried to save some for the next day, they found it wormy and rotten. Their greed had ramifications. They went hungry seeking to hoard what they did not need to hoard. They failed to trust in God and God's promises. Maui failed to trust in Tefiti and the shared abundance that comes through living in harmony with the world around us. And so Moana sets out to restore the heart of Tefiti and right the imbalance of the world. She convinces Maui to go with her, since he was the one to steal the heart in the first place. And they encounter Teka, who seeks to keep them from Tefiti. It is only through Maui's eventual self-sacrifice that the heart is able to be restored. Teka turns out to be Tefiti, unrecognizable without her heart. She transforms back into the verdant island of Tefiti and the balance of creation and humans in the world is restored. Together, Maui and Moana, through much sacrifice, practice restoration of creation. They learn the balance of living with their daily bread and living out God's vision for the world, all while remembering who is in control. Through the manna in the wilderness, the Israelites are shown an alternative way of being in the world. It is a way that goes against the powers of the world, AKA the Egyptians, and towards the way of God. For the people of Motunui and for the Israelites, this is really challenging. The ways of the world are familiar. There is safety in what is known, even when, it, when what is known comes at the expense of God's creation and the way of God. Yet, both are called to step into new ventures, called to turn away from the familiar into a new reality and a new future. The Israelites receive a practical lesson in God's abundance of living within their means, of sharing with one another, and of trusting in God's provision. And yes, if someone is used to excess, this often feels like sacrifice and punishment. And yet it isn't. It is God's daily bread. 
siblings in Christ. It is also our calling to turn away from the familiar and into a new reality, a new future. A reality that trusts in God and God's abundance. A reality that turns away from greed and constant desire for more, more, more. A reality that turns toward acceptance of God's daily bread. A reality that cares for our neighbors, for other people, and all of God's creation. This is our calling. Are you ready to get uncomfortable and turn towards God?